Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk mostly about the United States, uh, in part because I know it better, uh, but also in part because of its uh, unique significance in the global system. That's uh, been true uh, dramatically since the Second World War. The character and extent of this uniqueness uh, often isn't understood and uh, would be easily worth a talk in itself, but I won't go into that. However, we constantly see that uh, even in uh, uh, relatively small ways. So for example, when uh, a housing bubble in the United States burst a couple of years ago, uh, that initiated a global uh, economic crisis, which uh, most of the world is still mired in. Uh, the uh, worst outcomes were just uh, averted by quite desperate measures. Uh, in another domain, when uh, France and Britain uh, wanted to bomb Libya a couple of weeks ago, uh, they had to turn to a more uh, reluctant uh, Washington to do the heavy lifting and provide the uh, vast bulk of the means of violence. The uh, U.S. has a huge uh, comparative advantage in that domain. Uh, furthermore, although uh, the United States uh, U.S. society and its uh, political economy uh, are unusual in some respects, uh, it's not that different from elsewhere. Uh, the, uh, and in fact, uh, developments within the United States over the years have often foreshadowed what is uh, uh, going to happen pretty soon in uh, other uh, uh, industrial societies of the state capitalist world. Uh, well, the, that world, in fact, the whole world is, of course, always changing, uh, but there are significant continuities, and they're worth bearing in mind. Uh, one continuity is that those who uh, uh, control the economic life of a country uh, also tend to have overwhelming influence uh, over state policy. And that should be a truism taught in elementary school. It was uh, formed succinctly by Adam Smith in words that I've quoted before but are important enough to repeat. Uh, he, speaking of Britain of course, he wrote that the principal architects of policy uh, are the owners of the society, in his day the merchants and manufacturers, the masters of mankind as he called them, and they ensure that state policy serves their interest, however grievous the effect on others, including the domestic population, but primarily the victims of what he called their savage injustice abroad, and India was his prime example. Uh, it was early in the days of the destruction of India. Uh, well, today the uh, masters of mankind are uh, uh, multinational corporations and financial institutions, but the lesson still applies, and it helps explain why the state corporate complex is indeed a threat to freedom and, in fact, even survival. Well, by now there are uh, important uh, elaborations of Smith's truism applied to the modern world. Uh, the most uh, significant and sophisticated version that I know is by uh, political economist uh, Thomas Ferguson, what he calls his investment theory of politics, which in brief uh, and simplified essentially views U.S. elections as uh, occasions in which uh, coalitions of private investors uh, coalesce uh, to invest to control the state. It turns out to be a thesis of quite high predictive success over more than a century, as he shows. Uh, what it means, in effect, is that uh, elections are pretty much bought and that the buyers expect to be rewarded. And that happens all the time. It was illustrated very clearly in the uh, last U.S. presidential election 2008, uh, President Obama's victory uh, traces largely to a, a huge uh, influx of capital from the financial institutions, especially toward the end of the campaign. They prefer preferred him to his uh, opponent, uh, McCain, and they expected to be rewarded, and of course they were. Uh, the country at that time was mired in a deep recession, uh, so Obama's first act was to select an economic team it was drawn almost entirely from those who had caused the severe economic crisis that he inherited. He systematically avoided uh, critics of their practices, including quite prestigious ones, Nobel laureates. Uh, actually, the business press 
uh, wrote rather ironically about this. Uh, Bloomberg News did a review of Obama's economic team, went through each one of them, uh, looked at their records, and said, concluded that uh, these people shouldn't be uh, on the economic team to fix up the economy. They should be getting subpoenas, which was pretty correct. They didn't, of course. Well, not surprisingly, the team chose measures which rewarded the major culprits who are now uh, richer and more powerful than before and uh, poised to lead the way to the next and uh, probably more severe financial crisis. Now, there was recently an interesting article about this by uh, the special inspector of the bailout programs, Neil Borofsky. Uh, he wrote a bitter condemnation of the way it was executed. Uh, he points out that the legislative act that authorized the bailout was a bargain. Uh, the financial institutions that were responsible for the crisis uh, would be saved by the taxpayer and the victims of their misdeeds, in fact, real crimes, the victims would be somewhat compensated by measures to protect uh, home values and preserve uh, home ownership. It was mostly a housing crisis. Well, only the first part of the bargain was kept. The financial institutions were rewarded uh, lavishly for causing the crisis, and they were forgiven for outright crimes, but the rest of the program uh, floundered. Uh, as Borofsky points out, I'm quoting him, uh, foreclosures continue to mount uh, with eight to 13 million filings forecast over the program's lifetime. While the biggest banks are 20% larger than they were before the crisis and control a larger part of the economy than ever, they reasonably assume that the government will rescue them again if necessary. Indeed, credit rating agencies, uh, credit rating uh, agencies incorporate future gov uh, government market uh, bailouts into their assessments of the largest bank. That means exaggerating market distortions that provide them with an unfair advantage uh, over smaller institutions which continue to struggle. So in short, as he puts it, Obama's programs were a giveaway to Wall Street executives and a blow in the solar plexus to their defenseless victims. In other words, the government uh, listened uh, to those who have a voice in the political system and acted accordingly, all completely in accord with uh, Smith's truism. Well, there should be no surprises here. There are uh, careful studies of Senate votes over a long period, and they show that the Senate is indeed responsive to a sector of the population, uh, the top third in income. Actually, a closer analysis would show that it's a very small fraction of that uh, top third. In contrast, there's no correlation at all uh, between Senate votes and opinions of the middle third. Uh, for the bottom third, uh, there is a correlation. It's negative. Uh, Senate votes are counter to preferences for the bottom third. And on major issues of foreign and domestic policy, there's quite a sharp disconnect between public opinion and public policy uh, over a long period. Well, one might argue that these results don't really depart very far from the intentions of the founders of the society. So James Madison, who was the main framer of the constitutional order, uh, he explained to the Constitutional Convention that uh, power should remain in the hands of the Senate. The Senate was not chosen directly by voters until about a century ago. Uh, in those days, uh, the executive was pretty much an administrator, not an emperor. And the House, third part of the system, which is closer to the public, had much more limited authority. And that's the way, in fact, it was set up. Uh, as Mott Madison explained to the Constitutional Convention, the Senate represents the wealth of the nation, the more capable set of men, men who have respect for property owners and their rights, and understand that government must protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. That's quite accurate, something else that ought to be taught in elementary school. Uh, we should uh, bear in mind, however, in kind of in Madison's defense, that his mentality was pre-capitalist. So he assumed that a senator would be, as he put it, an enlightened statesman and benevolent philosopher. Uh, the Senate would be 
a chosen body of citizens whose wisdom may best discern the true interests of their country and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Uh, they would just, they would uh, therefore refine and enlarge the public views, uh, guarding the public against the mischiefs of democratic majorities. This is all rather like the uh, noble uh, Roman gentleman of the fantasies of the day. Actually, Adam Smith before him had a sharper eye. Uh, well, it didn't take long for Madison to uh, shift his thinking about this as he viewed the early results of the democratic experiment. He had second thoughts. In fact, by 1792, just a couple of years later, by then he deplored what he called the daring depravity of the times as the stock jobbers become the Praetorian band of the government at once its tool and its tyrant, bribed by its largesses and overawing it by clamors and combinations which isn't a bad description of uh, today's political system and its uh, social and economic correlates. Well, today, in the richest country in human history, 20% uh, of the population qualify for food stamps. Uh, real unemployment today is at the level of the Great Depression for much of the population, manufacturing workers, for example. Uh, and in fact, their actual circumstances are much worse than in the Great Depression which I'm old enough to remember. Uh, most of my family were unemployed working class, and the country was, of course, far poorer than it is today. But it was a hopeful period in many ways. There was a sense that uh, people were doing something about it, and that times would get better. And indeed, they did, uh, thanks to act very active organizing, CIO, other things, and then an immense uh, government stimulus, first during the war, then continuing through the post-war decades. Well, that's not true today. The jobs that are being lost are unlikely to return, at least under the current programs of the masters of mankind. Not graven in stone, but that's their programs. Well, while the population suffers, uh, Goldman Sachs, which is one of the main architects of the current crisis, uh, they're now richer than ever, and they have just quietly announced uh, $17.5 billion in extra compensation for last year, with the CEO, Lloyd Blankfein, uh, getting $12.6 million, uh, while his base salary more than triples. And exactly as Borofsky said, they're poised to play the same game again. Uh, why not? They can rely on the government insurance policy uh, that enables them to safely engage in uh, risky transactions, make huge profits, and uh, they don't take into account what in the jargon of economics are called externalities, the effect of a transaction on others, uh, crucially in their case what's called systemic risk, that is the likelihood that the whole system will collapse as a result, a result of their risky and hence profitable transactions. And when it does collapse, as is anticipated, it's not a big problem. Uh, they can run to the powerful uh, nanny state that they nurture, uh, clutching in their hands their copies of uh, Hayek and Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand and so on, and they can demand the bailout uh, to which they're entitled because they are uh, uh, too big to fail, as it's put. And as one commentator uh, added, uh, Riley also too big to jail for quite serious crimes. Uh, it's a pretty impressive scam. Of course, it's in radical violation of capitalist principles, but the masters of mankind uh, believe in those principles only for others, uh, not for themselves. And that stance has a long pedigree. That's another matter that's important to understand if we want to grasp the nature of the world in which we live. Actually, it lies in the background of a a very revealing interaction that's taking place right now between two countries that are quite different in terms of independence and economic development, the United States and Egypt. The democracy uprisings in the Arab world, particularly in Egypt, these are events of truly historic importance, and they're very frightening to Western power. 
uh, for very simple reasons. Uh, the West is certainly going to do whatever it can to prevent authentic democracy in the uh, Arab world. Uh, to see why, it's enough to take a look at the uh, studies of Arab public opinion, which are certainly known to planners, even though not to the Western public, at least to those who keep to the media. Uh, what they show is that, for example, in Egypt, uh, the, uh, uh, about 90% of the population think that the United States is the main threat uh, that they face. Uh, uh, maybe 10% think Iran that is a threat. Actually, about 80% think the region would be more secure if Iran had nuclear weapons. Uh, and the, those figures happen to be high in Egypt, but they're pretty much true across the Arab world. So it's obvious that the West is, not, is going to do whatever it can to prevent uh, those opinions from entering into policy, which means to prevent uh, any form of uh, authentic uh, uh, democracy. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, uh, the, these are extremely important events, and it's important to take a look at how they're developing. Uh, so the first, uh, the, all of these have long histories, incidentally. So for example, the Egyptian movement, you probably saw, was uh, led by a group of young uh, tech-savvy uh, uh, people who called themselves the April 6th movement. Uh, why April 6th? Well, that's a reference to a major uh, 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 a labor action that was prepared, planned on April 6th, 2008 at uh, one of the major industrial uh, installations in Egypt, the Mahala textile uh, uh, installation. There was supposed to be a big strike, a lot of support activities. And I was crushed by the uh, military dictatorship that we were supporting. Uh, forgotten here, you know, who cares, but not forgotten there. And the same is true in the other countries. The things that have been, uh, that have suddenly burst forth are not coming from nowhere. Uh, that's true of the first one too, which doesn't even get reported. Uh, the current wave uh, of uprisings actually began in uh, the last uh, uh, African colony, uh, one of the two countries of the Arab world that is, uh, was invaded, uh, occupied, and settled by an outside power, that's Western Sahara. Uh, technically a UN dependency, supposed to move on to decolonization. It was invaded in 1975 by Morocco. Uh, brutal invasion, like most, uh, settled a lot of the Moroccan population there, illegally, of course. And there have been repeated protests. There was another one in November, an effort last November, an effort to set up a tent city. Uh, Moroccan forces quickly crushed it. Uh, since it's a UN responsibility, the issue did come to the Security Council. Uh, but France made sure that there would be no inquiry into what happened. It has to protect its uh, Moroccan client. Uh, that was the first. Uh, the other occupied country, as you know, uh, nothing so far the lid has been on tightly. That's uh, Palestine. Uh, plenty to say about that, but I think most of you are uh, familiar with it or should be at least, uh, not least from the very courageous and important work done right here by the late Jim Graff. Well, whatever is going to happen, it's not clear. Uh, it's, all of this is still work in progress. But despite uh, internal barriers and external constraints, these popular movements have achieved substantial success. And they have uh, pretty exciting prospects. Uh, one of the most dramatic recent moments was last February, February 20th, when uh, Kamal Abbas, uh, sent a message from Tahrir Square in Cairo to Wisconsin workers uh, saying, we stand with you as you stood with us. Uh, Abbas is a leader of the, uh, the years of struggle of Egyptian workers for elementary rights uh, that lie in the background of today's uh, Arab Spring. As I said, brutally crushed by the Western-backed dictator. He's also a leading figure in the current uprising. And Abbas is uh, Measure, a message of solidarity to Wisconsin workers evoked the traditional uh, aspirations of the labor movement, uh, solidarity among working people of the world and uh, populations generally. Well, right now the trajectories in Cairo and Madison are intersecting, but they're headed in opposite directions. In Cairo, towards gaining elementary rights denied by the dictatorships, in Madison towards 
defending rights that have been won in long and hard struggles and are now under severe attack. And each of these is a kind of a microcosm of tendencies that are underway in global society following uh, varied courses. And there are sure to be uh, far-reaching consequences of what's taking place in the decaying industrial heartland of the richest and most powerful country in human history and in uh, what President Eisenhower called the most strategically important area of, in the world, namely the Middle East, a stupendous source of strategic power, it probably the richest economic prize in the world in the field of foreign investment. Those are the words of the State Department in the 1940s. That was a prize that the U.S. intended to keep for itself and its allies in the unfolding new world order of the day that they were organizing and implementing and in fact still do. Well, it's uh, normal for the victors to uh, consign history to the trash can and it's normal for the victims to take it seriously. And if we want to understand the world, we should follow their example. Uh, today is in fact not the first occasion when Egypt and the United States are facing similar problems and moving in opposite directions. Now, that was also true in the uh, early part of the 19th century in ways which are quite crucial for both societies and generalize across the world. And are crucial for understanding of the creation of the divide between the, the rich first world and the poor third world, much less sharp back in those days. Well, at that time, early 19th century, uh, Egypt and the United States uh, were both well-placed to undertake rapid economic development. Uh, both of them had rich agriculture. Uh, that included cotton, which is sort of the fuel of the early industrial revolution. Although unlike Egypt, uh, the United States had to develop cotton production and a workforce by conquest, extermination, and slavery, uh, with consequences that reverberate to the present. Now, there was one fundamental difference between Egypt and uh, the United States, uh, namely the United States had gained independence, and it was therefore free to ignore the prescriptions of economic theory, uh, which were pretty much the same ones as today. At the time, they were delivered by the greatest economist of the day, Adam Smith, in terms uh, similar to those preached to uh, 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 what are called developing societies today. So Smith urged the American colonies to keep to what was later called their comparative advantage, that is to produce primary products for export and to import superior British manufacturers and certainly not to try to monopolize crucial goods. And that meant particularly cotton in those days, kind of like oil today. Uh, any other path, he warned, I'll quote him, would retard instead of accelerating the further increase in the value of their annual products, produce and would obstruct, instead of promoting, the progress of their country toward real wealth and greatness. Approximately what you study in economic courses today and the advice uh, given to the world by the IMF and the World Bank. Well, having gained their uh, independence, the colonies, U.S. colonies, were free to ignore the laws of sound economics they were free to follow uh, England's own course of uh, independent uh, state-guided development uh, with high tariffs to protect industry from superior British exports, uh, first textiles, later steel and others, and a wide variety of other modes of state intervention in order to accelerate economic development. And uh, the independent republic also uh, tried and came pretty close to uh, tried to get a monopoly of cotton uh, for a good reason. The purpose was to place all other nations at our feet, as the Jacksonian presidents put it at the time, uh, when they were annexing Texas and half of Mexico. Uh, 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 they were particularly concerned with England. England was the big enemy in those days. It was a deterrent. Uh, and they figured if they monopolized cotton, they could bring uh, England to its feet. That's pretty important. It's, for example, it's one of the reasons why Canada wasn't conquered. The British deterred it several times. Uh, maybe it's being conquered in other ways, but that's another matter. But it wasn't militarily conquered. Uh, they also couldn't conquer Cuba much as they wanted to because the British fleet was in the way. 
They did finally conquer it later in the century, 1898, under the pretext of liberating it, but actually conquering it. Uh, but the idea was if they could monopolize control of cotton, they could overcome this uh, deterrent that was in the way of expansion. Actually, it's kind of interesting that that's, that's essentially the policy that was uh, 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 attributed to Saddam Hussein in 1990. Ridiculous at that time. But if you look back at the propaganda at the time of the invasion, uh, the pretext was, well, he's trying to monopolize oil and you know, to bring us all to his feet. I mean, it's totally outlandish. But uh, the, what was charged, uh, the crime attributed to Saddam Hussein, is in fact one of the main ones that led to uh, U.S. economic development. Uh, it happened and uh, it's had a big effect. One of the reasons it's out of history, except that it's in history. Well, that was the United States. What about Egypt? Uh, Egypt couldn't follow a comparable course because it was barred by British power. It wasn't independent. So British uh, Lord Palmerston declared on his words that no ideas of fairness toward Egypt ought to stand in the way of such great and paramount interests of Britain as preserving its economic and political hegemony. And he expressed uh, what he called his hate for the ignorant barbarian, Muhammad Ali, the developmentalist leader who was uh, trying to direct Egypt on an independent course. And uh, uh, Britain's fleet and financial resources uh, were deployed to uh, terminate Egypt's uh, quest for independence and economic development. Uh, after World War II, the United States displaced Britain as a global hegemon and it adopted the same position. Uh, the U.S. made it clear that Washington would provide no aid uh, to Egypt and the whole world badly needed aid at the time. Uh, the U.S. would uh, uh, provide no aid to Egypt unless it adhered to the standard rules for the weak, the ones I cited, which of course the U.S. continued to violate itself imposing high tariffs to bar Egyptian cotton and causing a debilitating debt sh dollar shortage. Actually, that's the usual interpretation of market principles. It's uh, fine for you, uh, fine for disciplining the weak and controlling them, but not me, please. I want the nanny state to make sure I'm okay. Uh, that applies at home too, the way uh, Goldman Sachs and its colleagues and their representatives and government understand very well. These are really leading themes of modern history. Uh, they're the basis for the, essentially the basis for the first third world distinction. This generalizes all over and for what's happening internal to the rich societies as well. Well, as these uh, kind of quite simple principles uh, predict, elections are increasingly just becoming a charade. Uh, run by the public relations industry, uh, which tries to mobilize uh, populations uh, to vote while making sure that issues are marginalized for the reason I mentioned. The public has different opinions about issues than the masters of mankind, so you want to keep them aside. Uh, I should say that while I'm talking about the United States, it's not true everywhere. So if you go, say, to the poorest country in South America, Bolivia, they actually have democratic elections. Uh, pretty uh, remarkable ones, especially in the last 10 years. So in the last 10 years, the uh, most repressed, uh, uh, bitterly repressed uh, segment of the population, the indigenous population, uh, have actually entered the political arena, uh, pressed their demands, uh, took part in elections, won the elections, elected someone from their own ranks, uh, a poor peasant, you know, not somebody from the skull and bones uh, at Yale, and, uh, uh, and uh, won the election on real issues, serious issues, like control over resources, uh, uh, cultural rights, uh, how to handle the problems of justice in a complex multi-ethnic society. And then in a, another election a couple of years later, they did even better. Well, that's democracy. You have to look pretty hard to find anything like that in the industrial world. Uh, what's happening in our society is, is something quite different. The uh, public relations industry, which essentially runs the elections, it's applying a certain principles, uh, namely the same principles, uh, it's, it's applying certain principles to undermine democracy, which are the same as the principles it applies to undermine markets. 
uh, the last thing that business wants is markets in the sense of economic theory. Take a course in economics, they tell you a market is based on informed consumers making rational choices. Uh, anyone who's ever looked at a TV ad knows that's not true. In fact, uh, the industry, uh, if, there was, if we had a market system, uh, an ad, say, for General Motors, uh, would be a, a brief statement of the characteristics of the products for next year. That's not what you see. You, know, you see some you know, a movie actress or a football hero or somebody you know, standing, driving a car or, you know, up a mountain or something like that. But uh, the point is to create, and, the point, and that's true of all advertising. The goal is to undermine markets uh, by creating uninformed consumers who will make irrational choices, and the business world spends huge uh, uh, efforts on that. And the same is true when the same industry, the PR industry, turns to undermining democracy. It wants to construct elections in which uninformed voters will make irrational choices. It's pretty reasonable, and it's so evident you can hardly miss it and it's another one of those things that ought to be taught in elementary school. It's kind of embarrassing to talk about something so obvious to a university audience. Well, uh, all of this is uh, second nature uh, to the masters of mankind. And so, for example, after his 2008 victory, as perhaps you know, uh, Obama immediately won an award from the advertising industry for the best marketing campaign of 2008. Uh, he beat out Apple computers. And if you look at the business press, uh, where people talk more openly, uh, executives were euphoric. Uh, they said uh, they'd been marketing candidates like uh, toothpaste ever since Reagan, but 2008 was the greatest achievement. They said it was so great it's going to change the style in corporate boardrooms. Uh, the 2012 election is now expected to cost two billion dollars. It's going to have to be mostly corporate funding. So it's not at all surprising that Obama is selecting business leaders for top positions. The public is quite angry and frustrated. But unless the Western populations can, say, rise to the level of Egyptians, they're going to remain victims. In the United States, the Republicans uh, long ago uh, ceased any pretense of being a traditional political party. Um, they are so deep in the pockets of corporate America you've, and the super rich that you need a telescope to find them. Uh, Democrats, who incidentally by now are mostly what used to be called moderate Republicans, uh, so the Democrats there are not too far behind. Obama's choice of an economic team, which I mentioned, is an example. Actually, I didn't put it quite accurately. There was one exception in his economic team, namely Paul Volcker. He was the Secretary of Treasury under Ronald Reagan. Uh, but the spectrum has shifted so far to the right that Folker was the last liberal calling for some kind of regulation. It was, incidentally, not is. And he was kicked out and replaced by uh, Jeffrey Immelt. He's the CEO of General Electric. That's the nation's largest corporation. And his special responsibility, if you look back at the rhetoric, was to create jobs. Actually, a more accurate comment, again, by Tom Ferguson is that what we actually have here is the disappearance from the scene of the best known and most visible critic of the excesses of the financial sector and his replacement by the sitting CEO of a company that is heavily dependent on government aid of all sorts, including diplomatic assistance to invest more in China and to shift jobs there. This is not about jobs. Uh, it's about political money. Now, the White House knows it will need to raise about a billion dollars for its re-election campaign. That's the context in which this uh, and Obama's other recent appointments need to be judged. And the business world, not surprisingly, was quite pleased. The London Financial Times reported that uh, Mr. Immelt's appointment was applauded by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, major business lobby, which they said has been among the president's harshest critics and funded many Republicans who ran against Democrats in last November's election. Uh, but maybe that'll be over and the last barrier to business rule uh, could be out of the way. Uh, well, if you look at GE, General Electric, 
Uh, more than half of its workforce is abroad. Uh, more than half of its revenue comes from overseas operations. Uh, also, most of its revenues come not from production, though it's regarded as a manufacturing enterprise, but from uh, financial operations, for which, incidentally, it received a hefty bailout when Wall Street tanked. Uh, while the appointment was proclaimed to be for job growth, it actually has little to do with that. Uh, more accurately, it's uh, what's called follow the money. Uh, more than a century ago, the great political financier, uh, Mark Hanna, said that uh, two things are important in politics, uh, money, and I've forgotten the second one, uh, <laughs> another thing for elementary school. Uh, that's uh, far more true today, especially with the radical changes of the past 30 years, and they're important to understand. Now, these developments, roughly the last 30 odd years, now, they followed one of the major changes in world order in the modern period, namely the dismantling of the post-Second World War economic system, so-called Bretton Woods system, which had been designed by the victors of the Second World War, the United States and Britain. Uh, the basic designers were John Maynard Keynes for Britain and uh, the New Deal economist Harry Dexter White for the United States. Uh, one central component of this system was regulation of currencies. Uh, in fact, that was part of the basis for the huge economic growth of the next couple of decades, the highest in history. Well, that was dismantled about 40 years ago. That was one factor that led to the uh, huge explosion of financial speculation and the vast growth of financial institutions. Uh, at that time, they were small components of the economy, and they were mostly doing what uh, banks are supposed to do in state capitalist systems, namely to direct unused funds, like say your bank account, uh, to some kind of productive investment. Uh, that was then. By 2007, uh, just before the great crash, uh, they gained about 40% of corporate profits in the US. Uh, their profits come mostly from complex financial manipulations, uh, actions that have little, or if any, uh, social or economic utility and, and are harmful to the economy and also to people in many ways. Uh, these uh, practices would be sharply curtailed if capital principle, capitalist principles were to prevail. They'd be curtailed by crashes and you know, losing your money. But uh, thankfully, there's no fear of that, at least for the rich. Uh, another factor in the uh, financialization of the economy was that the rate of profit in production was declining. So it was easier to make money by financial manipulations, of course, always with the protection of the nanny state. Uh, closely related development was the offshoring of production. That's within a global trade system that is very carefully designed to set working people in competition with one another worldwide, along with a very high level of protection uh, for, for wealth and unprecedented rights for investors. Uh, that's the usual interpretation of market discipline again. You know, fine for you, but not for me, please. Uh, these uh, developments set in motion a vicious cycle of concentration of wealth, and with it, concentration of political power, again, in accordance with uh, Smith's maxim. Uh, for the past 30 years, uh, state corporate policy has been very precisely designed to accelerate this cycle. So inequality, as you probably know, has soared to the highest levels in U.S. history, but less known is that this is actually misleading. The radical inequality results primarily from the extraordinary wealth of the top 1% of the population, actually more accurately the top one-tenth of 1%. It's a group so small that it's missed by the U.S. Census, which vastly underestimates uh, inequality for this reason. It's been studied by economists. Uh, meanwhile, for the uh, uh, majority of the population, uh, uh, real incomes have pretty much stagnated. Uh, people are getting by with heavier workloads, much more, say, than in Europe or even Japan, uh, debt and uh, uh, asset inflation like the last housing bubble. Uh, the minuscule category of victors, and it is extremely small, 
Now that's uh, primarily uh, CEOs, uh, hedge fund managers, and the like. And they use their political power to enhance the process. So tax cuts, for example, are carefully crafted to benefit the super rich. If you look back until around 1980, until Reagan, now taxes were in the United States were somewhat redistributive. It's according to the analysis of the Internal Revenue Service, uh, as in most countries. That's what they're supposed to be. Uh, since then, with a couple of blips, that effect has declined. And if other factors are introduced, uh, like, say, tax havens and other evasion options, uh, they redistribute upwards. Uh, that's uh, carefully designed. So take, say, the Bush tax cuts 10 years ago, uh, which are a huge burden on the economy. Uh, they were designed very carefully. Uh, the, they started in the first year with a tax rebate to people, small rebate. So you get a couple hundred dollars in the, in the mail. You think, this is great, tax rebate. But they were designed so that over the years, the uh, benefits would shift towards the rich. And by the 10th year, when they were due to expire, uh, more than uh, about uh, uh, one, uh, more than half of the uh, tax benefits went to the top 1%, the people who count. But then it, it's kind of invisible if it happens that way. There's a name for it. It's called the sunset technique. Uh, you make sure that by the time the sun sets, things are happening the right way. You kind of delude people at the beginning. Uh, and uh, only those who are inside the game can see what's planning. Uh, down the road. Uh, there's uh, 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 these are uh, uh, perfectly uh, 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 normal uh, 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 kind of uh, policies for the people who are called conservatives who now want to make, uh, make it permanent. Take a look at the front pages of the newspapers. They want to make these cuts permanent, uh, but uh, for jobs, the same as here. Uh, the reason we have to give a huge amount of money to the top 1% of the population or a fraction of that, uh, which spends it on whatever they feel like, is for jobs. Uh, actually, there's an interesting change that's taken place in the English language in this respect. Uh, there is a word which has become obscene, so since there may be children in the audience, I can't say it, but I'll spell it. Uh, P-R-O-F-I-T-S. You're not allowed to say that. Uh, in fact, it has a pronunciation. It's called jobs. So, uh, if, uh, and, and that's kind of by now like routine. Uh, the, uh, and that's what this is about, the same here. Uh, well, all of this is, uh, uh, in fact, these kinds of things, that was the Bush tax cuts, but the same thing's happening right at this moment. Uh, like the, you know, the lame duck session of Congress, that means, you know, the session after the November election, before the next Congress takes office. Uh, Obama was greatly praised for his achievements during the lame duck session, you know, statesmanlike uh, display of bipartisanship and so on, and praised by his own supporters, in fact. Well, there were some achievements. Uh, the main achievement was a tax break for the super rich. Uh, and I mean super rich, like I'm pretty well off, but I'm below the cutoff for that one. It was super rich tax cut. Of course, that increased the deficit, which is supposed to be the big thing we're worried about. Uh, carrying that off required some pretty impressive footwork, but it was done. Uh, also at the same time, there was a tax increase for federal workers, but it wasn't called that because you're not supposed to talk about tax increases. It was called a freeze, uh, I think for five minutes, a freeze for maybe five seconds. A freeze for public sector workers is identical to a tax increase for them. So this is a tax increase for public sector workers disguised as a freeze. Uh, there was also uh, a payroll tax decrease for Social Security. The Social Security is paid by working people, doesn't contribute anything to the deficit, uh, contrary to what you read. Uh, workers pay for it, and there was a decrease in that payment, which kind of sounds good, people need the money. Uh, but again, it was a Trojan horse. Take a look at the way it was designed. It was the sunset technique again. The freeze was carefully designed so that it ends right before the presidential election. Now, political figures understand perfectly well that with an election coming up, nobody's going to say, let's raise the payroll tax. So that essentially makes it permanent, which is a way to defund Social Security. 
Social Security is actually in pretty good shape, despite what everybody screams about. But if you, uh, if you can defund it, it won't be in good shape. And there is a standard technique of privatization, namely defund what you want to privatize. Like when Thatcher wanted to privatize the railroads, first thing to do is defund them. Then they don't work, and people get angry, and they want to change. And you say, okay, privatize them, and then they get worse. You know? And in that case, the government had to step in and rescue it. But that's the standard technique of privatization. Defund, make sure things don't work. Uh, people get angry, uh, hand it over to private capital. Well, that's the uh, Social Security scam. Uh, if they can succeed in defunding it, been trying for decades, it's too popular to do much about, uh, and very efficient, incidentally, minuscule administrative costs, you know, nothing like the outlandish privatized healthcare system. Uh, so it's kind of hard to get rid of, but if you can defund it, it might work out. That's the point of this decision in the lame duck session. And that's kind of important. Uh, Social Security, uh, first of all, if it can be privatized, it's a huge bonanza for investors. There's a ton of money in the uh, Social Security system. It's kept in a trust fund or invested in government bonds and goes back to working people. But if that can get into the hands of financial institutions, uh, they can make a ton of money by uh, using those uh, funds to enrich themselves and, as usual, when the system crashes, to going back to the taxpayer to bail them out. So it's a great uh, technique. Also, uh, Social Security has, uh, really has defects. Like it's, it's, almost, it's, it's of no use whatsoever to wealthy people. I mean, they may get it, but they're not going to notice it. It's a you know, toothpick on a mountain, uh, so who cares? Uh, but for uh, uh, a large part of the population, it's their means of survival. Uh, that's particularly true right now. Uh, people had a tremendous amount of their fake wealth, which they believed it in, uh, in housing. It was all a fake bubble, but they believed in it. It's what was used for borrowing, for education, for anything. <coughs> that's gone. Eight trillion dollars of it are gone. Those people are going to be surviving on Social Security. Uh, but that's of no significance to the wealthy, of course. Well, there's a kind of a deeper point. Uh, Social Security is based on uh, the principle that Kamal Abbas was talking about, namely solidarity, social solidarity. Social Security is based on the idea that you're supposed to care what happens to people who are in need. So like if there's a disabled widow across town and she doesn't have food to eat, you're supposed to care about it. That's what Social Security is. And that's a bad idea. Uh, you're supposed to look after yourself, not care about other people. The Social Security is dangerous. Uh, it uh, kind of undermines preferred doctrines, and it can even lead to action, which could change the way the world works. So we don't want that. Uh, in fact, the, there's a large-scale attack on public education. It's based on the same principles. If you can privatize, and the same techniques are being used. Defund it so it doesn't work. Complain about how it doesn't work. Privatize it. Gets worse. Uh, but then uh, you've undermined social solidarity, and it's fine for the wealthy anyway. They'll get what they want. Well, all of this is part of a quite impressive campaign of class war, uh, which has many aspects. Uh, a lot of them aren't immediately visible, but they're there. So, for example, the government sets rules on, corp on how corporations are run, what's called corporation, corporate governance. And the rules that have been set up during this uh, passionate class war period, the rules are that CEOs can pick the boards that set their salaries. And they can, and that, you know, work out techniques like, say, stop, stock options, which uh, conceal short-term gain. And you can imagine how that works when you pick your own board. Now, well, there have been efforts to try to get this to be more transparent, but they were beaten back by Congress. Uh, same is true of deregulation. Uh, during the period when New Deal regulations were maintained, there were no financial crises. The uh, system went along smoothly. Uh, since Reagan, uh, there have been regular financial crises, each one worse than the preceding one. But the rich and powerful make out fine, for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, public pays and uh, rich benefit. Well, that's a, all of this is a kind of a new stage of state capitalism. Uh, loyalty to firms is less and less necessary uh, when the goal of management is short-term profits, which of course comes mostly from financial manipulations. So who cares about the firm if it 
goes under, fine, I'm, I'm rich. Uh, domestic unemployment is not a problem. Uh, so there's no need for a domestic workforce when Mexico and China and Vietnam and uh, other sources of cheap and brutally exploited labor can be used as assembly plants, and, and they are assembly plants, China as well. Uh, major industries increasingly have their workforces overseas, like uh, General Electric, while, uh, I have to say that word, I'm afraid, sorry, while profits come home uh, back to the pockets of a few. So take IBM, it's a, quite an interesting example. The business press recently ran a big article about them and said that correctly that IBM may strike many people as the quintessential American company, but over 70% of its workforce was outside the United States at the end of 2008. And the following year, while continuing to reduce its U.S. employment, the company announced a program to offer employees the opportunity to, to move their jobs to emerging markets. In other words, you have the opportunity to move to India, say, uh, where you could live at a much lower standard of living. Nice opportunity. Uh, but that increases the, what's called the efficiency of the company, and it uh, provides wealth for the masters. Now, if employees don't take this opportunity that is so benignly offered to them, now they have options. They can join the people standing in line for food stamps. But IBM's a benevolent company, the article points out. Uh, they're offering to uh, foot some of the relocation costs, so they're really nice guys. Uh, the uh, report in the business press didn't explain why IBM should be regarded as the quintessential American company, but there are, in fact, good reasons. Uh, one is that uh, IBM relied on the taxpayer uh, for its wealth. It, that's how it learned to uh, I'll forget about earlier things like helping out Nazi Germany. But just in the recent period, it, uh, it learned to shift from punch cards to uh, uh, um, computers modern computers, it learned it at Pentagon-funded labs, like MIT, where I work, for example. Uh, when finally, in the early 60s, the firm was able to produce its own fast computers, but they were too expensive for businesses, so then any state, state stepped in to purchase them. Now, in general, a procurement by the state is a major device of taxpayer subsidy. Well, many years later, actually decades later, uh, IBM was finally able to make profits in the market and was also able to spin off uh, wildly successful uh, enterprises like Microsoft and others, which also benefited uh, amply from public subsidy. So indeed, it's true. The, it is the quintessential American company, uh, and management is following sound economic principles in shifting employment abroad. Uh, what happens to the country is not their business. Well, it's worth noting that this really is new. Uh, not very long ago, the long-term future of the firm was an important consideration for management, less and less so under modern forms of state capitalism. And rather interestingly, uh, these issues were foreseen, foreseen by the great founders of modern econo economics. Adam Smith, for example, uh, he recognized and discussed what would happen to Britain if the masters adhered to the rules of sound economics, what's now called neoliberalism. He warned that if British manufacturers, merchants, and investors uh, turned abroad, they might profit, but England would suffer. However, however he felt that this it wouldn't happen because these people would be, the masters would be uh, guided by a home bias. So as if by an invisible hand, England would be spared the ravages of economic rationality. Now that passage is pretty hard to miss. It's the only occurrence of the famous phrase invisible hand in Wealth of Nations, uh, namely in a critique of what we call neoliberalism. Now the other leading founder of modern economics, uh, David Ricardo, he drew similar conclusions. He hoped that uh, home bias would lead I'm quoting him now, would lead men of property to be satisfied with the low rate of profits in their own country rather than seek a more advantageous employment for their wealth in foreign nations. And he said, these are feelings that I would be sorry to see weakened. Uh, well, the, their predictions aside, the uh, uh, instincts of the 
classical economists were quite sound. Well, I mentioned before uh, one well-known uh, market inefficiency effect of the market inefficiency of uh, dismissing externalities, that is the effect of a transaction on others. Uh, in the case of financial institutions, uh, the externality that's dismissed is uh, systemic risk, the risk that the whole system will crash as a result of some failed transaction. You don't take that into account when you make a transaction. Well, in that case, the taxpayer can come to the rescue and it makes sure then that way you can make sure that those who profit from risky transactions will be saved. But that's not always an option. And the consequences can be severe. In fact, perhaps awesomely severe. So nobody's gonna to come to the rescue if the environment is destroyed. And that it must be destroyed is close to an institutional imperative under contemporary state capitalism. Just think it through. Uh, business leaders right now are conducting massive propaganda campaigns to convince the population that uh, anthropogenic global warming, you know, global warming with, because of human interference, is a, a liberal hoax. Uh, and they're succeeding. Uh, like in the United States, probably two-thirds of the population believes this by now. Uh, well, the CEOs who are running these campaigns, uh, they understand what all of us understand. They understand that the threat is very real, uh, very grave, uh, that it'll destroy everything they own, it'll wreck the lives of their grandchildren, they know all of that. But they don't, as CEOs of a corporation, in that institutional role, they have no choice. Uh, they, they can pull out, of course, uh, but uh, if they stay there, they have to maximize short-term gain and market share. Actually, that's a legal requirement in, under Anglo-American law. Uh, if they don't do it, they'll be out and somebody else will come in who does do it. So it's an institutional property, not an individual one. And it does set off a vicious cycle, the one that could be lethal. And to see how imminent the danger is, just have a look at the new Congress in the United States, the one that was propelled into power by large-scale business funding and propaganda. Almost everyone there is a climate change denier. And they've already been acting on those assumptions. They've been cutting uh, the limited expenditures there are for dealing with environmental problems. Uh, uh, and if the United States doesn't do anything significant, the rest of the world isn't either. Well, worse than that, some of them are true believers. So for example, the head of, uh, the new head of one of these uh, committees on the environment, he explained that global warming can't be a problem because God promised Noah that there wouldn't be another flood. It takes care of that. Well, you know, if, if that was happening, you know, like in Andorra or some small uh, remote country, you know, maybe we would laugh. Uh, but it's not laughable when it's happening in the richest and most powerful country in the world. And before we laugh, we might uh, bear in mind that uh, the current economic crisis is traceable in no small measure uh, to the fanatic faith in such dogmas as uh, the efficient market hypothesis. And in general, to what uh, Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz uh, 15 years ago called the religion that markets know best. The religion made it unnecessary for economists and the Federal Reserve uh, to notice that there was an $8 trillion uh, housing bubble that had no basis at all in economic fundamentals, it was way off historical trends, and that devastated the economy when it burst. No need to look at it because we have the religion. Markets know best, so forget it. Well, all of this and that religion is resuscitated, despite what happened. Uh, uh, well, uh, all of this and much more can proceed as long as the general population is passive, uh, apathetic, uh, devoted to consumerism, or maybe hatred of the vulnerable. As long as that's true, the powerful can do as they please, and those who survive uh, will be left to contemplate the ruins. <laughs>